example of a, of a case um, where I was working with some of my best uh, technicians. Nice. And basically, the case had been protocoled uh, to look for hypertroph uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This was a 25-year-old man uh, referred from an outside uh, provider. So we had nothing on this patient. We hadn't done an echo. We hadn't done oh. chest x-ray. We had nothing. We were doing this for an outside provider. And basically, this, uh, this young man had leventricular hypertrophy, which is a, an abnormal thickness increased th thickness of the, of the heart muscle in the left ventricle. This is the ventricle that pumps the blood, the red blood, towards the aorta and, and the systemic circulation. So he had this both on EKG, which made the, the, the provider get an echo, and they confirmed that. And sure enough, when we looked, these are uh, city images in steady state of free procession. On the left panel, you have a short axis view at the papillary muscle level that shows both the left ventricle posteriorly and the right ventricle anteriorly. And you see that the function is actually very good, but the, the, the thickness of the, of the muscle is quite increased on, yeah. on the left side. Um, did you want me to point that out? Yeah, uh, we're so, just going to give you the cursor if you want. Okay. So let me see if I can put the arrow here. Okay, big arrow. So this is the left ventricle with papillary muscles here, the interventricular septum. This is the right ventricle. These are the, in, the inferior walls or the diaphragmatic walls. You can see a little bit of liver here. This is the lateral wall. This is the anterior wall. Same thing for the RV, anterior wall, lateral wall. On the right-hand panel, this is a 90-degree view to this view called the three-chamber view or long axis. And there we see, so the, the view on the left is a cut right through here at the papillary muscle level. So. This view opens up the left ventricular cavity. It still shows the right ventricle, but only the front part of it. And now we see the aortic valve. Uh, cinema, uh, in steady state of preprocession, um, because of its properties, uh, is good to show uh, blood flow within the heart. It, ought, it doesn't show it, perhaps, as vividly as the classic gradient echo. Uh, simply because of the way the, the, the sequence is engineered, um, we don't see blood motion as well, but we can suspect that there is probably something wrong with the aortic valve. There's a little bit of leakage. You can see spin dephasing yeah. here in diastole in the aortic valve. The aortic root looks a little bit generous, perhaps. Normally, the aortic root and the left atrium, which is right here, are about of equal size. So you see that the aortic root is bigger than the left atrium and that there is left ventricular hypertrophy with a preserved function. So, yeah, indeed, um, this... Um, this, uh, this person could have a host of diseases that find, um, you know, that with left ventricular hypertrophy. Now, the thing with left ventricular hypertrophy, we run into, if we simply look at thickness, we run into the same problem as echo. And there's a host of different things that can give uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, you know, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or HCM, is a genetic condition that affects about 1 in 500 people where you, you, know, you get transmitted from your parents, yeah. one of your parents, and it causes an abnormal thickening of the heart muscle. And the heart muscle is not as efficient uh, in contracting. There's a little bit of what we call fiber disarray. So the, 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 the myocardial fibrils, instead of being parallel, are kind of a little haphazardly oriented. Uh. So the heart doesn't have as much strength, and perhaps uh, this causes a compensatory increase in, in, in the thickness we're not sure exactly how uh, all of that happens, but we know that these hearts are quite thick, and the thicker you are, the more problems you run into, basically, because you've got to feed all that muscle, obviously, and uh, if, you're, if, you're, if your circulation, if your coronary circulation isn't good, because often these hearts don't relax properly, well, they don't get the greatest blood flow, um, you know, sometimes, sure. so it can lead to, 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 to problems. You can get other conditions, um, you know, another condition called uh, amyloid, which can also be transmitted gen genetically, causes an increased uh, muscle thickness, but it's because of there's a, an accumulation of abnormal proteins within the, the heart muscle. And this also impairs the chondrocyte because the, the myocardium has to compete for space with all this protein that's doing just sitting there that's amorphous. Right. Um, people who have uncontrolled high blood pressure uh, with end-stage renal disease you know, obviously oh, okay. will have uh, thick heart muscle. So the commonest cause of left ventricular hypertrophy is actually hypertension. Um, so you can get that with, um, with severe hypertension. And then there's another cause here. Um, uh, this is another genetic abnormality called Anderson-Fabry, which is another um, um, 
uh, uh, type of uh, st- genetic uh, storage disease that that's uh, that can give thickened heart muscle. So it sounds like it could be treated pharmaceutically, or a lot of um, these? sometimes yes. Some some of these can be uh, well, they uh, you know obviously undoing what nature is as 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 dealt you with at birth, and these are right. in a way they're kind of congenital, but they're we call them genetic abnormalities. Um, but uh, these these abnormalities obviously put uh, put these patients at risk of cardiac events heart failure, arrhythmia, sudden death. Right. So they have to be looked at and, uh, you know, they have to be evaluated and, and what we call risk stratified. And MRI pr- plays a pretty big role in doing that. Mm. The advantage MRI has over echo is that not only can you look at, w- at wall thickness, but for the reasons I've said earlier, we can also give a gadolinium enhancement. This is an example of a patient, a different patient uh, with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And you can see here that... Um, this um, patient has um, uh, what we call systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. The function is just as good. as It resembles a lot what our patients has. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but when we give gadolinium uh, to these patients, because there's sometimes scars within the myocardium, for the reasons I've exposed, a uh, discrepancy between the blood flow that you offer the myocardium and its needs, this sometimes leads to scars. And these types of scars are seen with the off-label use of gadolinium. That's the late um, GAD enhancement. That's right. And you have here an example of this enhancement in the septum that doesn't really correspond to, to a coronary territory. It's kind of in the middle and typically occurs in the most in the, in the thickest parts and, and where the hypertrophy is the most severe. But it's kind of haphazardly uh, um, there within, within the myocardium. You can see it wherever the myocardium is thickest. I'll move on to the next slide um, to show you other examples of, um, of um, so this is an example of amyloid. Again, oh, if you okay. compare it to our patient, if you look at without gadolinium, different patient. But, um, you know, you can see that the heart muscle is thickened. The functions, eh, a little bit reduced, perhaps. You see that the atria are quite enlarged. And you were asking earlier about the lungs, the, the field of view. This is, this is an example of, of a right pleural effusion that's seen readily with uh, steady state of free procession. See how fluid appears quite uh, vividly. You can also see a small uh, posterior pericardial effusion here. And, and I've, it, I've worked with you before, and I know when I see pleural effusion, that's usually when you ask to do that free breathing cine. Sometimes we do that because within the diagnosis, within the differential diagnosis of, uh, of pleural effusion, you have to take in, you know, well, the commonest cause is heart failure. Right. related to, well, a right pleural effusion in, in particular is going to be heart failure related to, um, you know, either a low pump function, someone who's had a heart attack or has a cardiomyopathy mm-hmm. or an excessively thick and non-relaxing stiff ventricle. Um, so these are, uh, when, I, when I see, for example, more of a left pleural effusion, that tends to correlate more with pericardial disease. That's interesting. I didn't know that. And then, so when I see a left, pericar- uh, left pleural effusion, I mean, obviously, the commonest cause there would be a, a left lung problem, like a tumor or something like that. Right. But you can see that sometimes with pericardial diseases. And there, I'll look for constriction, or I'll look for inter- ventricular interdependence with the use of, uh, with the use of uh, steady state, free procession, free breathing. Um, now, what, what happens when we give these patients uh, with amyloid gadolinium, because um, the, the extracellular space is expanded, and there's, there's lots of room between the different... Uh, uh, structures, look how gadolinium basically floods the myocardium yeah. and totally uh, enhances diffusely. This is a most this is a really extreme form of uh, of, of cardiac amyloid. That can, um, be good, right? that can be good. No, and these patients really have a not not so good a prognosis. Oh. So these are the things we sort of think about. Uh, we can go to the next slide, uh, David. Uh, so these are some of the things we were thinking of for this uh, for this uh, young man. So. We did. We administered gadolinium, uh, and we saw we saw that really there wasn't all that much uh, to write home about. So few. <laughs> you oh, didn't seem to have. Uh, still on there. There we go. There we go. So in the in the LGE uh, sequences, we don't see much in the way of uh, hyper enhancement. Maybe a little something at the septum. So we haven't quite, um, you know, ruled out HCM, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But there's, you know, the, this heart. Um, Another thing that I look at, obviously, the, the, the hypertrophy is fairly symmetrical. In, in genetic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it tends to be a little more asymmetric. Not always, but sometimes. Right. Uh, and the other thing is we can look at the septal curvature. You can see here that it's concave, means it's going, insi- uh, you know, it's going outward. 
in, in genetic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, it tends to be the opposite. It seems to be sort of convex and bulge inwards. So these are some of the things, not an absolute criteria, but right. these are all things that we look, we look at. The thing that, uh, that struck me, and the reason uh, I, I went on with the, so this patient was scheduled to have a perfusion study of his myocardium mm -hmm. um, because we were looking for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But I, I changed the, the mode of administration of, of gadolinium in this patient for this particular reason, because as I came in, and I came in sort of a little late, you know, with my coffee, the, the, the techs had already started, and they were, you know, getting ready to do the thing. I said, well, let me just look at the, you know, the basic pictures. Right. And put my coffee down and then just start <laughs> going through. Um, we could see that um, in, the, in the proximal descending aorta, the, the aorta looked absolutely tiny, oh, yeah. which made me think of a potential congenital anomaly. So instead of doing just a perfusion mm -hmm. study, I said, time out, time out. We're going to do... We're going to do a, uh, 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 an angiogram, so we'll, yeah. we'll, or as we say, uh, uh, sometimes a twist. Right. Uh, so, so that's what we did uh, in this patient. And really, this showed us that this patient had and severe hypertrophy on the basis of hypertension. Indicating. That was not mentioned by the, by the clinician. Right. And he had a really, really tight narrowing of the proximal descending aorta here. And you have a volume rendered spinning i don't i don't want to make you dizzy here but uh, <laughs> uh, hold on tight we but for can, you uh, mr techs out there this image he's referring to the twist that uh, we call that the candy cane yes yes so this is um a case of coarctation of the aorta one of those congenital anomalies that can occur right. in in people uh you know, is that like a ca like a time. plaque buildup or it's it's a congenital narrowing of the proximal descending aorta or you're born that way basically really? yeah. and that particular problem accounts for about let's say 7% of all congenital defects. I told oh, you that really? over half is the bicuspid valve that's, that's, that has two leaf Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, it seems like the, the flow would be very turbulent right there. Very turbulent, and you can see that there's compensatory um, uh, collaterals, so the body will not sit there idle. I mean, if there's right. a severe blockage here, which you can also see here posteriorly, I'm trying to move the arrow not too fast, Right here, this is where the uh, the narrowing is. You can see that the body has built its own bypasses, so it's a form of oh, of natural that. bypass that the heart is trying to build to help blood travel from above to below. And you can see that sometimes we see that there there can be dilatation of the of the uh, aortic uh, of the ascending aorta. We can certainly see here that the left subclavian looks a little bit prominent. There's the left carotid and then the brachiocephalic trunk. So in this person, instead of going for medication, what we recommended was a percutaneous coarctoplasty and stenting. So we oh. opened up that. Uh, uh, so I referred the, from, from the MR lab. I called my, my colleague uh, in the congenital clinic who was doing uh, cath and, and intervention. I said, I got a guy with severe coarctation, unknown, basically. Uh -huh. um, he's not too symptomatic. He did have severe hypertension, so <laughs> he um, got uh, pr had a procedure the following week, and we, we opened up his coarctation, and you know he felt uh, a lot better. So just say like something maybe in a threat to me. I, I did uh, um, hybrid kind of IR cases, but and we did threctomies in the lower extremities. But is that something you could do up there? Uh, you could do that. I mean, it's it's a to open up that So typically, what well, what was done in this particular or case? Or stented, or I don't know, grafted. That's grapped exactly it, what maybe. we did with stenting. So we, we so MR plays a role certainly here in in delineating the severity of the of the coarctation of the narrowing. Oh, right. You can also see if you're going to be deploying a stent in this area. Well, you want to know where those cerebral uh, vessels and and where the subclavians are going to be. Typically, um, they'll use covered stents, uh, but you know, or or, or you know, they want, they'll use a stent certainly to, to, um, to minimize the risk of recoil. Right. Yeah. And the thing with this is that it's been there like this, this has been there for 25 years. He's 25 years old. Yeah. So there is a small risk. If you do plain, uh, balloon coarctoplasty, there is a small risk that someone may develop, um, a false aneurysm at the site of, of dilatation. So All that right. stent really is a bit of a safeguard that, that, that helps us minimize this risk. Um, you know, obviously. Now, this is a, an approach we can use in an adult. Obviously, if you are, are dealing with a tiny little baby who's going to grow, and you put a stent, it's 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 not as right. it's not the same thing. So <laughs> in 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 infancy, a lot of these cases 
presently right. uh, are, are going to get operated by, by, by capable uh, cardiovascular surgeons specialized right. in congenital heart defects. But this can be a, a nice uh, way to take care of a problem, especially if the, if the uh, coarctation is tight, but relatively distant from the, the, um, the cerebral vessel, so you don't end oh. up jailing the, the subclavian artery right. uh, with your stent, basically. So, and what um, symptoms was like, could he, like, how could he go 25 years like that? Well, um, he did have hypertension. He did not see doctors very often. And, right. And that doctor, I hope, took the blood pressure. <laughs> but this was certainly not mentioned to us. Uh, right. Um, so we took the blood pressure, obviously, as we do for every MRI case. And obviously, this BP was 170 over, over 90 um, right. in both arms. And we had trouble feeling the pulses in his lower extremities because of you know, the, 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 the blood flow not good. But this is not part of a normal cardiac MRI. Right. We, we examined him because we, we, we saw findings. But this is just an example of why it's important for the doc to be in the room when you're doing this. Right. Because yeah. we could have, we wouldn't have missed it, but we, lo- we would have lost a nice opportunity to administer gadolinium the right way right. for this patient. So right. I think here you, you've got to be flexible and you've got to be able to make changes on the fly sometimes to address the specific problem. Yeah. And... Be ready for surprises because cardiac MRI has has surprises sometimes.